sold the whole movie as an NFT. He's like, you couldn't fit a whole movie on one NFT right now. In two years, probably, maybe less, you will be able to. He's going, but right now, no. He's going, why? What are you thinking? I was like, we have this movie that we're about to take out into the marketplace. The same way I've done for like, you know, 27 years since I went up the hill back in 1994. It's a Sunday, it's to sell clerks. I was like, we're in the 21st century, man. And this is a platform that, yes, was based in finance, but is now also based in art, man. And art is like where I live and breathe, the only thing I want to do in this life. So what if we took it into crypto world and sold it? We'll sell an NFT. Welcome back, everybody, to Altcoin Daily. My name's Austin. Writer, director, filmmaker, Kevin Smith joins us today. You know him from movies like Clerks, Dogma, Chasing Amy, Tusk, one of my personal favorites, and now diving headfirst into the cryptocurrency NFT space, auctioning off his next movie, Killroy Was Here, as a non-fungible token, as well as other Jay and Silent Bob character drop NFTs. Kevin, thanks for joining us all that you're a fan of tusk oh my god dude i got queasy at the end of that <laughs> it is one of my way. favorite things i've ever done um and it was a very late in life uh, art film something that most people would get out of their system early like when they picked up a camera for the first time in film school but for me that was clerks and i never really got to do anything experimental um and so later in my career that's when i did like red state and and tusk and those always felt like movies I should have done before anything else, but finally got around to doing. That's the important lesson of life from a 50 year old. Like always get around to doing it. If you don't do it right now, this second, just make sure you get to it somewhere down the road. We always get a bunch of great ideas over the course of our lives I've found. And at least personally speaking, there've been many occasions where I'm like, I should do that. And then I was like, yeah, yeah, nah, somebody probably smarter than me did it. And blah, blah, blah. Oh, maybe I'll get around to it. And then somebody does it. And you're like, man, like I had the chance. And this brings us to me jumping into the NFT space, man. Cause I, first time I saw one was on my Twitter feed probably about three months ago. And it was maybe four, some, I don't know who the artist is, but he had done a piece that looked like a sculpture, a 3D sculpture of uh the tesla guy smoking weed on joe rogan's show and i was like blown away because i was like this is gorgeous where can you get this and, and somebody was like it's an nft it only exists and so it piqued my curiosity into that curiosity comes my friend david shapiro who runs semcore i had made a movie called kilroy was here with him uh started right before my heart attack then i had a heart attack three years ago then we finished the movie, but then we went off and made Jane Silent Bob reboot and then toured that in 2019. So during the quarantine year, David and I were finishing Kilroy was here and then we we're going to take it to marketplace. It's a horror anthology film, kind of like creep show. So David reaches out to me and he goes, um, I want to do a Kilroy NFT because he's way into crypto um, to kind of promote the film. And he had, you know, just hit me at a time where I was already had a passing familiarity. And I was like, oh, I just saw one of these NFTs. And I said, it's very, very cool. What do, you, what do you have to do with it? And he's like, I'm deep in crypto, man. This is my favorite thing in the world. Um, I, I, I chill on Fantasma Chain. Like, this is my new passion. And he's going, I feel like we could create a preview NFT for the movie that we could kind of create awareness for the flick and stuff. So he started explaining blockchain to me. And I, I, I've had since Christmas, Jason, you know, the guy stands next to me in movies and TV shows and, and in real life. And um, his, him and his wife gave me a percentage, tiny percentage of a Bitcoin. And, you know, I, for me, I was like, thank you. But finance scares the fuck out of me. Like it didn't connect with me in terms of money. I didn't connect with crypto until somebody said art. And then I was like, you have my attention. So, you know, David was talking about how he's deeper into the world of crypto. And I was like, well, explain. He started defining blockchain for me. And then we started speaking exclusively about like the NFT that he was talking about for Kilroy. So at the end of his discussion, I was like, David, I I'm all for this, but I think feels like, cause I'm a guy that sold stuff for like 25 years online, t-shirts, toys. We got a 
comic book store Jane Silent Bob's Secret Stash for 24 years now as well in the real world. So I said, what I think you might want to do, I don't know if anyone will notice if we bring a Kilroy NFT in the marketplace. Feels like we start with a Jane Silent Bob NFT and his eyes lit up because we were on Zoom. And he was like, I didn't dare dream to ask you, but that would be so much better. Would you be willing to do that? And I was like, oh, please, absolutely. And the idea of more Jane Silent Bob art, like that's great for my ego because people who draw us, they don't tend to draw the later in life, you know, Elvis years of Jane Silent Bob. They always draw us in the 90s when we're vital and young and stuff. So, you know, I, I love that. My house is covered in graphic art um, that looks like me and Jason. There's a whole room right outside this room that's nothing but Jay and Silent Bob drawings from people all around the world and stuff like that. You know, great artists and, and amateurs. So right away, I was like, this makes sense. You know, and also I've, I'm old enough to go back to like, you know, I've been collecting since I was a kid, man. Mad Magazine, comic books, uh, Star Wars cards, all three of the movies, all the different colors that they ever released. I didn't go heavy on sports cards ever because I was not really a sports kid, but I have a collector's mentality. So I was like, David, I, I get this. This is, this is my world. This is like, you know, a hologram card from the Marvel collection back when I was a kid that me and Jason Muse fought over, not physically, because Walter, my friend, gave Jason the card and not me. Like, it looks exactly like that and feels like that world. So I, I get this, man. And so we had this discussion that went over the course of three days. By the end of it, we'd kind of discovered like Jay and Silent Bob's crypto studio, the idea of having a gallery for people who could draw us to come and like team up with us. We got the IP, you got the talent. Like here's Jay and Silent Bob, you draw them, we create an NFT, we sell it, bye bye. You know, and so I'd been talking about doing a real world gallery at Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash in Red Bank, like curating it because we got more space now, we just moved fairly recently. So like, you know, putting up the slat walls and then hanging art and doing shows in the midst of our store. This gives me the ability to do like an online gallery show at any moment for any drop worldwide and not force people to go to like Red Bank, New Jersey. So I started falling in love with the idea of, of the crypto studio as this gallery. I was like, all right, so we'll have an anchor product, something that we make that makes hopefully people come and pay attention. Then while they're there, we introduce them to the artist of the month, their drop, and every drop we keep adding an artist and we build our library until finally there are more artists making Jane Silent Bob art than us doing anything, than making anything. They don't need us as an anchor because now people know this is the place to go, like our own nifty gateway, so to speak. So at that point, um, you know, uh, we came up with the smoking tokens. Uh, which is like what our anchor product is like the uh, the idea of the NFT with a little bit of audio on it is a graphic drawn by Captain Ribman. We put some life into it, stuck it in a little box and stuff. So we figured that would draw folks to the site. And then you kind of shine a light on somebody like Captain Ribman who drew that. But then he's also our featured artist for the first drop with a blunt man and chronic comic cover, which is gorgeous Has lightning. The figures slide in and Jay talks and stuff. So while we were talking about doing all that, and while we were talking about the Kilroy pre preview NFT, like, you know, I said to David, I was like, we gotta have something that draws attention to the drops beyond the product itself. So I said, with the smoke and token, you know, we got four different colors, we could have a fifth color, and with that fifth color, it could be super exclusive. If you win that, that gets you a cameo in Clerks 3 because we're going to be shooting that this summer. And he was like, oh my God, that's great. So that's where the platinum token came from. And that was meant to be the driver. The biggest news was like, you could buy one of these platinum tokens and wound up in, and wind up in Clerks 3. And then shortly before, you know, we start making our plans public, we were building the Kilroy NFT, which is gorgeous. So you could see it on the site, the comic book and stuff. And I was like, David, this is a work of art, like in and of itself. He's like, that's what an NFT is. I was like, I understand, but like, this is phenomenal. Like we should make something this glorious and good looking for the actual flick. And David was talking about how many, and I was like, well, would be open minting. And I said, has anybody ever sold a movie yet in crypto? And he's like, there are people that have raised money for movies, uh, you know, in, in, uh, with NFTs, but nobody's ever sold a whole movie as an NFT. He's like, you couldn't fit a whole movie on one NFT right now. In two years, probably, maybe less, you will be able to. He's going, but right now, no. 
He's going, why? What are you thinking? I was like, we have this movie that we're about to take out into the marketplace. The same way I've done for like, you know, 27 years since I went up the hill back in 1994 to Sundance to sell clerks. I was like, we're in the 21st century, man. And this is a platform that, yes, was based in finance, but is now also based in art, man. And art is like where I live and breathe, the only thing I want to do in this life. So what if we took it into crypto world and sold it? We'll sell an NFT, like a glorious NFT looks cool, or if not better than the one we're selling for the preview NFT. But like, you know, we were talking about doing a four pack of the color smoking tokens. And David was like, people love it when you include a real world item as well sometimes. So I was like, okay, we can, for the four pack, we can make this t-shirt that me and Jay will sign only 40 of them or whatever. But you know, I was like, but wait a second. So like having a bonus in the real world is totally acceptable. He's like, yeah. So what if we sold Kilroy as an NFT? We sold the NFT of Kilroy and the real world bonus is you get the movie to distribute. Like you're also buying the movie the same way that I would have taken the movie and sold it to a distributor. We sell the NFT and it comes with the real world bonus of, by the way, you also get a movie to go play in the real world with. Like, you know, you'll, you'll have, of course, the NFT, which will be insanely valuable as a one of a kind, but then also outside the cryptoverse, like outside the blockchain, you have this asset that you can make all the decisions for, decide who to sell it to, if you want to sell it, decide to go theatrical, decide to just go streaming, all the things that we get to decide when we finish a movie and take it to market. Because the budget of Kilroy was very low, under a million bucks. So it felt like this, we got a finished film. You know, like we're not going into the world going like, we're selling NFTs to make a movie. It's like, we've made the movie. The movie is the NFT. And if you buy it, you got something in, in, uh, the, in, in the blockchain, of course, something very special and unique, but it also gives you an IRL asset to literally monetize, you know, almost like you would a game of Monopoly and you get to enter the movie business as a full-blown producer with your name on the flick and you get to make all the decisions. So David was like, if you're willing to do that, he's like, because there's always a chance somebody buys it and sticks it in their wallet, nobody sees it. And I was like, I sincerely doubt that because we'll build something so appetizing for the person that buys the NFT that heading into the real world is just like a no brainer bonus. We'll make the path so easy for them. It's not like we're going to be like, you got it, it's yours, Fuck off, goodbye. Like, I'm going to be there with them, promoting the movie, doing all the press, same way I do if we sell a movie to an actual movie studio and stuff. But we've got the benefit of experience of, you know, I haven't done this for like 25 years. So we're your partner, man. We're holding your hands. It's yours. Money's yours. But we'll be the ones going like, here's the people you can talk to. Here's our roll the decks. Here's any place you need us to go into. And my feeling was like, if, if this, if we pull this off, Kilroy goes from a movie that we have to inform people about to a movie that people know about because it's taken a, a step into a brave new world. Instantly makes that real world asset even more valuable for the NFT winner. So right now, you know, before anyone had ever heard of, of, of Kilroy was here, if that person had won the NFT and they have the movie, it's a bit of an uphill battle, but like now I have to educate the people what this movie is and try to sell this movie. I feel like if we do our jobs right by the time we do the second drop and we auction the Kilroy NFT, so much news attention is paid to it that like it makes selling it in the real world even easier because people are like, hey, that's that NFT movie. Now, you know, it works either way. It works if we do people's business when we sell it, or it works if we make nothing. Like if we sell it for, uh, you know, a thousand bucks or something like that, or a quarter ETH or something. And like at the end of the day, people are like, well, what? I was stupid. What a waste of time doesn't matter story travels people know about that movie it makes it instantly more valuable for for the owner of the nft in the real world so we analyzed it from all the different angles and i was like i'm willing to go for this you know like it, to me this is fun and also brings somebody into our world who maybe like didn't have as easy an access as i had i made clerks and suddenly i was in this is the chance for somebody who wins this nft to do the same so we decided that'll be the second drop. We'll open the doors of the crypto studio, do a Kilroy NFT, do the smoking tokens, do the Buntman Chronic cover. And then on second drop, we'll do the second version of the smoking token because it'll be a series of, I think, six or seven. Every movie that Jay and Bob have been in will have its own little smoking token. 
Um, so that drop will continue. We'll continue to add to our artist roster. So Nate Gonzalez, who does all of our Fat Man Beyond gorgeous artwork for our shows, live shows, he'll be our second artist featured in the drop. And then Captain Ribman will make a second Blunt Man and Chronic cover while Nate is doing his first. The following drop, Nate does his second and a new artist joins us, so forth and so on. Because we've worked with so many wonderful artists over the years, we have so many graphics. Not to mention the graphics we can easily create just by being like, you know, to Nate, I was like, Nate, do a piece with Jay and Silent Bob called Crypto Mofo. And he put together this gorgeous, gorgeous piece that uh, David and his, his uh, company, um, uh, Semcore, they built this gorgeous NFT for it. And then of course, you know, minted it on Phantasma. That gives it this kind of beautiful life. You know, it was a very flat two dimensional image and now it's like come to life. So for me, this is a playground because I know right now people could put up tiny pieces of video, you know, on, on an NFT. Within a year, two years, I'm probably gonna be able to put a lot of video onto an NFT, man. And so in a world where like, the Pacific theaters and the arc light have shuttered and closed. People like me who used to make movies only for a living, you know, we're, we're finding venues for our work being limited, shuttering down. You know, the world is shifting and stuff post quarantine. So for me, I'm like, you know, this ain't just crypto, this is Krypton, man. I'm going to head off to that planet because this planet's dying and I might be able to do my work there. I'm, I'm going to be able to make short films for years. People are like, you know, I made a short film. What do I do with it? And how do I monetize? That's the biggest question. Because, you know, normally, what do you do with it? Oh, I'll put it on YouTube. They're like, yeah, but I won't make my money back. I'm like, I, I don't know anybody that buys short films. We now live in a world where that same filmmaker can take that same short film, stick it onto an NFT, post it, sell it, make back all the money they spent to make that piece of art, man. Like, so this is where I want to live and breathe. Like, instantly, I was, I was in. We started building the studio, and now we're ready. We're going to open this week, but it looks like we're going to open uh, next week for business on, on uh, April 28th. So first auction, we'll have uh, the biggest feature, of course, or the big, like, ooh, talk about feature, is the platinum token, which means, you know, there's 10 crypto cameos in Clerks 3. Crypto plays a big role in Clerks 3. Elias, you know, our character from Clerks 2, is a massive crypto fan. He keeps trying to convince the boys that it's the future. And, of course, Randall is just like, you know, your pogs, beanie baby, your 21st century pogs, with no understanding of, of the field whatsoever. So since it plays such a role in the film... Um, it gives us this opportunity. Uh, Elias is part of this crypto club. And at one point, as he's talking about it, we cut to every member of the crypto club. There's only 10. So whoever's got that platinum token, bam, we're going to see you in your little two seconds of footage um, doing whatever it is you want to do. You're flashing your, your, your wallet. You're doing whatever you want to do as we go. Our, here's our murderer's row of, of crypto club and stuff. So for me, it's, it's absolute fun. I can't draw. I wish I could. I wouldn't inflict these terrible fucking movies on people. But I do know a lot of artists and I do have characters those artists could draw. So like, I'm in, I love this. And in terms of like the money and stuff like that, if it works, that's great. But I've never done anything kind of with money as the primary focus. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a communist, I'm a capitalist, I certainly like to make money. But that's never been the drive. If I was in this business for the money, I would have been out of it a long time ago because not enough people into my shit to warrant that kind of attention. But I learned direct to consumer in the 90s where it's like, hey man, I got a fan base and they're very ardent and they may not be as big as like Spielberg's fan base, but like they'll follow me where I go on my adventures and whatever I want to make. So I felt like, you know, early on, these are the folks that will carry me forever. I don't need to appeal to your mom or her uncle because like I've got these cats and those cats have been with me like every step of the way since 94. A lot of them are coming on this journey now too because a lot of them have been like buzzing in my ear about crypto. They're like, do you know anything about crypto? My daughter's boyfriend, Austin, um, who she's been with for like almost two years now. Like right after I, I spoke to David about the NFTs, um, Harley was like, Austin wants to speak to you about some crypto stuff. And I was like, that's weird. How, what weird timing? Okay. And so I saw him on Zoom and he was like, hey, I wanted to ask you a question. I was like, is it about NFTs? And he goes, how the f***? What did you, and I was like, I just literally had this conversation with something, somebody else. So David like kind of walked me into the world, but Austin was there to like kind of um, show off everything along the way because he is a 
ardent, ardent crypto blockchain fan. He's a guy that invests. He's a guy that was, you know, today was just like, I was like, are you doing Dogecoin? He was like, well, a little bit, but I don't really believe in the pump and dump as much as I love being in the space. Like I love watching the figures and stuff like that. So he's not like, I'm in it for the money. He's in it because he loves the space. And when I started talking about like, I, I think we're going to do a series of like Jay and Bob short films, like maybe a year from now, that will sell as separate NFTs that when you put together, it's one giant Jay and Bob kind of movie or something like that. And his eyes just lit up because he's like, that's, that's what's possible here. He's going, so many people look at this and come in and try to like make money, liquidate and stuff. But he's like, think about it as like a place to go where it's just starting. He's like, think about it like what YouTube was 20 years ago when suddenly they opened the doors and a bunch of people were like, we could create here. We can just do whatever we want. He's like, it's that fertile of a playground and he was the one that first described the metaverse to me too in great detail that I got it where you know you know I'd heard of like a digital baseball card and stuff um, and I knew that people collected digital uh, stuff but I was like well I'm a real world person like look behind me all the real world things I grew up in the 70s and 80s and it's about holding a, a damn thing putting your hand on it and stuff and then Austin was like well think about this the amount of time that you spend on your phone and in the metaverse, he's going like, how often do you get to show off that shit? He's going, if I bought a sword in the real world, and I'm already starting to worry because this is my daughter's boyfriend talking about buying swords. But he's like, if I bought a sword in the real world and I put it on the wall in my room, I'd see it, Harley would see it, you guys see it when you walk in, but that's it. Maybe I take a picture and put it on Instagram, but it's like, it's got no use beyond that. He's going, I buy a sword in the metaverse, not only can I show it off and whatnot, but now I have a sword. I can take it to a game. I could also trade it. It also has a currency to it. And he's going, so why would I want a real world thing as much as I want something that is going to be like triply useful to me where I spend all of my time? And he's like, and you're the same way. He's like, you live online. Everything you do, the jamesallenbob.com, uh, that Kevin Smith club, like the ViewsQ message board going back to 1995. He's like, your whole world is online. He's going, you more than anybody should be able to understand this. And it absolutely clicked for me and stuff. So as a 50 year old, going to be 51 in August, I'm, I'm an old man and this shit should be, I should be looking at it puzzled and being cranky and waving a finger and just being like, get off my lawn. But instead, it just makes me feel like, oh my God, there's still some vitality in this old husk where I want to play. It called to me like a siren's call going like, you want to be here. You want to be here. And so here I am kids. Something that I like that you have is, is, is passion. Because we see a lot of uh, celebrities come to the NFT space because they see money being made, but you're in love with the space, which love I like. Space. And it's, I love the space now, but kids, you think about where it's going to be in two years. You, you've been in the space for a damn minute. You've watched it evolve in the brief time that it's been evolving. Think about what it's going to be like in two years. Like in a world where we're set, people, not me, but like, and believe me, I'll be next. People are selling real estate. They're building communities. What are you going to do in those communities, man? You got, you got movie theaters. You got clubs. And those are two things. I like to make movies. I like to stand on a stage. So I love this best of all possible worlds that we all live in and dwell in, in the physical world. But I love what's being built in the metaverse. And I love what NFT is making possible. All the NFTs are making possible at this point in crypto and blockchain. So, yes, I'm in love with the space, but I'm in love with where that space is going to be minute from now, 10 minutes from now, a year from now, 10 years from now. I'm going to die in the world of crypto, man. <laughs> I love it. Um, and do you, uh, once somebody buys Kilroy was here, and let's say they get inundated with Netflix offers and you know, a lot of distribution methods offering to one person who now owns this NFT, what does the original creator, you, get you know, every time it's resold? Good question. I would imagine the crypto world, well, First, the, the owner would have to resell that NFT, which even if you sell the movie, that you still hold the uh. NFT and it doesn't change. You know what I'm saying? So like, who I assume whoever has the NFT would hold on to it for like a long time. But that raises a great question, which is like, if you own the NFT and the movie comes with it in the real world, and then one day you sell the NFT, do you still own the movie in the real world? Well, let's break it down like the four pack that we're doing. So we're doing a four pack of smoking tokens. Uh, you buy that four pack, it comes with a real world t-shirt. One day you want to break up that four pack, sell the corner of the tokens, uh, the, the um, smoking tokens separately. Or even if you want to sell the four pack as a whole, 
it probably wouldn't include the shirt, right? Like shirt's yours, you've worn the shirt and stuff. So by the time the person who bought the Kilroy NFT, let's say like minimum after a year, they're like, I wanna sell this. And I doubt they'll go that fast. Their dealings with the movie in the physical world will already be done. So it's a second opportunity. If somebody was just in this for investment purposes, once the movie's all tied up in the real world, you have an NFT that you could turn around and sell. It might not be as valuable to the person buying the NFT because like, hey, does it come with the movie anymore? And you're like, no, I already took that. I cherry picked that. But you know, you still have a valuable NFT that you could actually uh, sell. But um, what a great question. That's something I hadn't thought of. And that's what I've loved about doing press for the last week. Number one, crypto community has been so welcoming. Like, you know, I have not encountered one person who's like, get out of here, tourist. Like, they're all like, oh my God, come and play. I have been criticized definitely by some people outside of the space, like people who don't collect NFTs, have no crypto whatsoever, have nothing but an opinion based on having read a few articles here and there and stuff. I heard from some, some of those cats, but in the world of crypto, all I heard was welcome. Oh my God, this is great. And what I'm getting from the world of crypto, like you guys just gave me now, great questions and great ideas. Like that's a question we hadn't even considered at this point. What happens if somebody sells the NFT? But now we have an answer and we'll put that in the fact when we put it up in a month, because this is something we were doing yesterday. Me and David were going over all the, well, what if this, what if this, what if this, what if this building in? Like there was a lot of concern from folks online, the ones who seem the most vocal about me not, uh, wanting me not to do the NFT auction was what if, like a Martin Shkreli type buys it and sticks it, you know, in his house and nobody ever gets to see. So that question being raised by the public was one that me and Dave were like, all right, well, let's build in that whoever buys the NFT and they are getting the real world bonus of Kilroy has to do something with the real world bonus of Kilroy, like has to move the ball forward. We'll help them. It's not like you do it or else you're in trouble. It's like, we're, we're here to help you, man. We're your agents of change. But will build in that you can't just stick it like in a digital wallet or something like that. And if that makes it less appetizing to somebody, like so be it. But it, it would feel like a waste if the asset just went away and wasn't seen by anybody. Um, and you know, we have, since we're the ones auctioning it, we have the ability to build in safeguards that that won't happen. But thanks to conversations like these, you know what I'm saying? Like, this has all happened so fast, as, as kids were well aware, the field moves fast. So like, we had to move fast to dive in. It was already like a fast moving stream. And so we didn't like, let's sit down, think out every possibility, and then move forward. We've been moving forward since that first conversation with David. So important questions like that are insanely useful. And that's you know, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to that all day. Like rather than somebody just being like, don't do this, the environment. And I'm like, look, I'm with the most environmentally sound group in crypto at this point with Phantasma Chain. So like, you know, I saw a graphic online the other day, which showed like a, a two carrots, a bunny about to pull two carrots underground. One had like tons of stalk and tiny carrot. And one had a big carrot and tiny stalk. And they were like, that's Phantasma Chain and stuff. So I felt pretty good about that in terms of standing in the face of criticism from people that are completely outside the field. But generally speaking, all I've been given is welcome. And then people like give me great tips or asking great questions like that, that will, you know, make our effort stronger. It'll make it better. Like there'll be no gaps and loose ends and stuff like that. Well, you definitely get it. It's like um, just the way you're talking now, approaching it from the point of view of not only as the artist or creator, but also what does my community get out of it? And, and you've always been, I mean, your filmmaking has always been like a Tarantino, like a Lucas, you know, I have a strong community. No, they're, they're good boys. You can't, they're, they're okay, but I mean, they're, <laughs> but I mean, but also the question is always, um, it, you know, it's clear, I think to a lot of people who get into NFTs that there is a lot of opportunity for the artists. And then there's some question of what do the people actually buying it get? but you are going like really in many things, but specifically you get the rights to the distribution of this whole movie. I feel like that's never been done before. And that's like clearly providing so much value. Like, so we're in Los Angeles, we're filmmakers out here. You know, a lot of people, yeah, yeah. A lot of people uh, probably just think, oh, I got the distribution next step profit, but obviously, you know, there's some predatory distribution things, especially if you're first starting out, you don't know what kind of deals to look for. 
and you're gonna you're gonna be working with them to make sure that they don't get hosed or whatever. Yeah, the idea is like we've got experience on our side and a Rolodex full of everyone you'll ever need to talk to. So based on, you know, when we do the auction and we assume it'll catch a lot of attention, it's caught a lot of attention thus far and we're not even near the auction at this point, but just the idea has certainly captured people's imagination. The feeling is that of whatever price it winds up moving for, the attention and the interest is going to be there because people are like, I've heard of that. That's that NFT movie or whatever. So at that point, like rather than let the, the winner of the Kilroy NFT just, you know, tread water and dangle and be like, good luck. We'll be over here. Let us know when you need us. You know, we got all the, the assets. We got all the material. We got all the people, the relationships and stuff. So we'll be there with them. It's like your decision. We'll introduce you to the people. We'll set up the deals. We'll tell you what deals are good, what deals are bad, blah, blah, blah. But ultimately, totally your call. Absolutely your call. You're the studio. Like, you know, just like how Miramax uh, bought clerks. And at one point they were like, to cut 10 minutes out of it. If you watch the flick and you're like, you know, I want to cut 10 minutes out of it. That is absolutely your decision. You discuss it with the filmmaker. I would be the filmmaker in this case. And then if you want to spend the money to reopen the movie, to go in and take stuff out, or, you know, even if you were like, I want to make one more sequence because it's an anthology film, right? So you could like be like, I want to make one more sequence and I want to be in it and stuff. Hey man, that's totally your call. If you got the money and you want to do that, I'm here to absolutely help facilitate that dream for you and stuff. So we, we're meant to be partners the entire way, but not financial partners. So whatever happens with Kilroy in the real world, like we're, we're going to make our money off the NFT, the real world asset, that's all yours. So we'll give you the advice and we'll tell you like this person or let's go with these cats or this offer is amazing and whatnot. But when you get your check, we're not going to be like, all right, we get to wet our beaks a little. We're done. Like, that's the way we're doing it. Because we don't do that in the real world. You know, I sell a movie to a studio. I do the press for free. It's not like I'm like, well, you got to pay me and go out there and do the press. It's all part of the project. It's all part of it and stuff. It's crazy value that you're giving with this NFT. It's, it's kind of like, I, I look, don't get me wrong. I love the T-shirt that we're giving out with the four pack. But the real world value uh, in terms of an NFT that we'll be offering, hands down, is Kilroy. Besides your NFTs, which aren't out yet, is there any other creator that you have bought an NFT from in the last month? Not yet, man. Not a single one. Not yet. I'm a shopper. Um, I, I'm a, a guy who looks. I've been to almost every gallery and stuff. And I'll be honest with you, some of the galleries I showed to David to be like, can ours look like this? This is what I want it to look like. But the first NFT I told David that I'm going to buy is my own. Nice. No, hey. I'm not gonna buy Kilroy. You know, I don't want people going like, I knew it, this prick. <laughs> not at all. But I can't wait to buy a green smoking token. Like, because I, I know what went into building it. I know, I know the 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 path we took to get here. So as soon as we open for business, I'm I believe me, I'm gonna get some anyway because like I'm involved, but I, there's nothing more thrilling than like putting your own money down for something that you you've made. There's something that's made like, you know, the toys and stuff like that. And so this will be my, you know, part of my press and, and being able to tell stories is going to be like the first NFT I ever bought was my own, you know. Oh, nice. Could you go into a little more how you chose Phantasma? Because there is a handful of notable NFT altcoins, uh, blockchains out there now. Why Phantasma? When David came to me, David was talking about Phantasma as uh you know the cure for uh the the uh eth blues if you will with people talking about high gas charges uh at, talking about you know the, the environmental effects of crypto david is a, a, an earth hugger himself so uh very zen uh practitioner of, of uh chinese medicine if i remember correctly so before he got into the world of finance and stuff like that so for David, it was also very important. He's like, I want to do something. I love the space and I love art, but I, I don't want to add to the, to the world's problems and stuff. So David was ex extolling the virtues of being on uh, Phantasma. And I was like, well, look, if you like them, you vouch for them. This is your world. I'm totally into them. And everyone I've met there so far have been really, really cool and, and wonderful people and stuff. And all of them, aside from being into the space, all of them do, do have you know this kind of ecological bent to them um which in the moment when we announced and and people were like um you know some people outside of the world were like hey man this is bad for the planet 
it was really nice to be able to stand there and be like, not our chain. Our chain is so fresh, new, and so like um, managed that we're not doing what like a bunch of people accused me of doing. Like, you, you know, just like, you're tilling the earth, you're killing the earth and stuff. I was like, I trust me. Like I, what I tried to say and probably inelegantly in Twitter was like, I've been making plastic Jane Silent Bob totems for like 25 years. Like those are killing the earth more than what we're doing with Phantasma. And honestly- and That doesn't justify it. I'm not like, and so, but, but like, you know, I, unfortunately, I, I live in a world where people like to have, you know, a Jay and Silent Bob action figure and stuff. And Lord knows I want to provide it for heaven's sake. So I put a lot of plastic into the world, um, which doesn't make me feel great about things. My carbon footprint, as far as that goes, is very large. And I am I, on the flip side, <clears throat> and I don't say this to irritate anybody or recruit anybody, but I am also a vegan. So my carbon pr footprint is greatly reduced as well. So, you know, I'm not saying one balances out the other, but like we do what we can, kids, you know, wh where we can. And, you know, I, I know some people I just lost. They're like, you're a vegan, f you. I'm not trying to flip you to veganism. I just, it saved my life. As previously mentioned, I had a heart attack, so I had to go vegan. So it's worked out for me. And uh, I'm full vegan for the health reasons. Austin's mostly vegan, so we totally get it. Sweet, sweet. I, I mean, I, and again, like it's never, I like when, when vegans get together, we can chat amongst ourselves about like how proud we are of what we're doing for the earth and stuff. But if we ever say it out loud, you know, we're castigated and like, oh, those vegans, you're in a cult and like that. But it, like I, if the cult is, I just want to live as long as I could possibly live having almost died three years ago, then yes, I am in a cult. <laughs> well, I ask Aaron almost every day, where do you get your protein? And I think he's a, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> beans, man. Hummus, okay. beans. There's, there's, it's out there. Like, you know, I remember I asked that question first. I don't, we, we certainly don't want to turn into the vegan hour. But my kid, after my heart attack, my kid was so scared because she's like, you know, life, just a, a, a sheltered life, right? Like a kid that uh, we didn't helicopter, but at the same time, I grew up a little bit more hard scrabble than my kid ever did. You know, we were always trying to figure out wood ends meet and that kid never had that problem whatsoever and stuff. Kind of blessed life, never really lost many relatives. My father died years ago, but that's about it. So she didn't have a lot of like heartbreak in her life. My, my heart attack scared the f out of her. Never seen my kid more scared because she was like, oh my God, it almost all came crashing down. So she was already vegan. And so the morning after the heart attack in the hospital, a nutritionist came into the room and was talking about like, well, you have... 100% blockage in the artery going across your heart. That's, you should really, you know, maybe think about going plant-based in some ways. And my kid was like, yes, dad, one of us, one of us. She's like, you have to do this. Like, this is, this will help. You got to try it at least. So I was like, look, I ate whatever I wanted for years and years. And I almost died last night. I'll try your thing for two months. And that was three years ago. I've been a hardcore vegan uh, ever since. Dirty vegan, I should say. I don't eat, I'm not like, give me a kumquat and some broccoli. Like, you know, I, I like my, I'm like, take that kumquat broccoli, turn it into a Beyond Burger, and then I will eat it. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm not the cleanest vegan in the world. But my kid, it was, it was such a big deal to her because she was like, yay, I saved my father's life. But my kid's also like, you know, she's hardcore animal, uh, compassionate vegan. So she loves animals, right? So she knew, like, not only could I save his life, but if I flip this loud ass, loud mouth mother, he will be out there extolling the virtues of veganism the way he talks about Star Wars and Marvel. And so she was like, he'll be a good get for the community. And she was absolutely right. She flipped me. And just like when I became a new stoner years ago, and I was like, let me tell you about the benefits of weed. Like, same thing <laughs> with veganism. I was able to go out there and, and be like, hey, man, and, and also sell it in a less irritating way like where you don't feel like you're being recruited i just tell you my experience i ain't telling you how to live your life but like i get enough people going you look like you're not gonna die anymore you lost a bunch of weight how the f did that happen and i'm like you're not gonna like the answer i want plant-based man and it's not as bad as you think and stuff so one of the first things i remember saying was like where, where am i gonna get my protein and you know i remember my kid going well, where do the animals get their protein? They eat it right out of the ground. That's what their protein's made of. But I was like, oh, it took me having a kid to become that much smarter. Thank Gorillas you. are vegan. Right time, yeah. And they're huge. Yeah. Right. Hey, 
Hey, I just wanted to quickly um, touch on your point. Uh, I appreciate you, you know, talking about the energy consumption, which is such a big narrative. Um, I think it's kind of a misnomer in some ways. You know, the crypto community doesn't, you know, understands, you know, where it's going. A lot of people in the real world, especially Hollywood, I think they kind of pick that to, so that they can sound smarter. But, um, you know, that's like for anybody concerned about that stuff, you know, it, it is scaling, but also, you know, there's no such thing as the energy police. Christmas lights use way more energy than anything. So, and also, uh, it's like, you know, I'm, I, I'm not, I ain't counterattacking or counterpunch. I'm too old and I've been around long enough to know that, like, some people you're never going to convert to what you like doing, or, you know, some people just aren't into it and stuff like that. So, I don't go out there and, and try to beat people over the heads and be like, hey, man, but ours is the best and whatnot. But those who know and look into it realize that, like, there's a thought going into this. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's the narrative uh, that they keep unfolding is usually told, correct me if I'm wrong, on social media. And, you know, you don't want to be a dick and point out, you know how much energy it took to just tell me how much energy I'm taking? <laughs> you know, it's like, if you're going to pull at that thread, it all falls apart, you know, and it was, it, where, where it's like nothing. Yeah. Stand in one place and do nothing, and maybe you won't affect others negatively. Yeah, so, we shouldn't have started the internet, if that's the case. If like, Which, you know, you know there have been years where some people are like, that might have been the best thing if we hadn't started the internet. But in a world where it exists, like, this is a place that just provided one more platform for me to go and storytell on, you know, so I, I appreciate that it exists. Thank the Lord. Understanding that in 10 days from now, 20 days from now, you'll learn a whole lot more about launching Kilroy's NFT learning every day. If Quentin Tarantino approaches you today and asks, yeah. asks for some advice on launching his own NFTs, what advice would you give him? I would probably say, like, I'd, t I'd say, look, man, the way we're doing it, we're doing it boutique style. I've always done it small. I, I don't need the widest possible distribution. Uh, you know, so if you want to do it with me on Phantasma Chain, we would love that. But if you want to be exposed to way more people, and there are plenty places, Nifty Gateway, places you could go, other places, I would definitely, I wouldn't try to steer him into my corner unless he was like, Oh, I want to help Jane Sound Bob's crypto studio. I'm all for like everybody being their own boss. So naturally I'd be like, Quentin Tarantino's crypto studio is just ripe for the take and run, run, run. So I would definitely advise him uh, as I've been advised, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to like come to me. Like I'd be like, you know, you, you belong in a place where everyone's going to see your stuff and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I'm used to hustle, having to hustle a little more. I don't mind that. You know what I'm saying? Like, in order to keep the Kevin Smith business alive, like I got to sell Kevin Smith on a regular basis. So I'm kind of used to that. He doesn't ever really have to sell Quentin Tarantino. That just sells itself. So I would, you know, I'd say, look, I'm happy to walk you through it, but you should probably talk to somebody smarter than me. I'd likely turn them over to you boys and stuff. You'd have way better advice for them uh, than I would and stuff. Like, for example, like uh, our first drop where, uh, you know, you're, you're going to need an Ecto wallet on Phantasma chain in order to like uh, get our stuff. By the second drop, when we do the Kilroy auction, we're talking about being on a larger platform, you know, not just at Jane and Bob Crypto Studio, so more people can have access to it. Because right, right now, if you wanna buy smoking tokens, you can use ETH, uh, you can use Soul. Um, but like when we do the auction, we want that to be available to everybody and every cryptocurrency there is so between our first drop and our second like you said we're gonna learn a lot more so i would never want to lead him astray man because like that if that dude enters a space like and believe me kids i feel like i'm not saying quentin's coming but once like i was like here let me put my toe in the water i heard from people that i have not heard from in this business in years who were like that's incredibly smart we were just about to do the same thing so i know some of your favorite filmmakers and studios and IP are coming uh, to this space. So I, I, I would I'd give them the best advice I can, but I'd also tell them like, you know, look, I'm figuring this out as we go along as well. 
I want to talk about uh, Clerks 3. You're in a pre-production for that, correct? Is the, is the script pretty much finished? Yeah, yeah, I'm on a fifth draft. I'd say we're pretty locked. Nice. I'm a huge fan of uh, Clerks 1 and 2, but especially 1. Um, actually, you. my favorite Kevin Smith movies are uh, Jersey Girl and Chasing Amy. Those are my two favorites. Not Tusk? No. Nope. Yeah, I, like, I like them all. I love Jason Lee and Mallrats it's, and Chasing Amy. It's all good. Nobody ever says uh, Jersey Girl. That means the world. That's my, my first horror movie was Jersey Girl. So thank you. For that. I, don't get, I don't get why some people, you know, don't like it because to me it has so much of everything. It has heart. It's funny. It's got Will Smith. So anyways. It's true. It does. It's got a little Will Smith. And I swear to you, periodically, it escapes my memory that like I made not a Will Smith movie, but a movie that had Will Smith in it. Like. And George Carlin, yeah. That movie, and well, George Carlin, of course, I think about him all the time. He's in Dogma and stuff. Jane Silent Bob Strike yeah. Back. But the, uh, you know, the the Jersey Girl aspect of it all, when the movie came out, we followed Geely, and so people were like, Bennifer and stuff like that. So I didn't get the time to, like, really appreciate, like, everything that kind of came along with it, like, as time went on. Like, when the movie does well, you live off it for a year, you talk about it forever and stuff like that. When the movie does poorly, you're like, well, it's in the rear view, let's, let's look ahead. And you don't really talk about the experience that you just went through until you get safely far away from the bomb and then you, you can look back or something like that. And Jersey Girl was one of those because it was a movie that was imploding as it was coming out because of the press surrounding those two. It wound up financially doing way better than Gili, which is a mind fuck, but still, you know, it was, it was tough. It was an uphill battle. So because of that, I always kind of like, you know, shut down, not shut down, but just like, I don't think about it as much. We raced to Clerks 2 right after that. And I think about Clerks 2 a lot more. But periodically, I do stop when somebody says something like that, where I'm like, we did have Will Smith in a movie, didn't we? <laughs> like, that's so f***ed up. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, so yeah, I liked Clerks 1. I liked Clerks 2. Now you're getting into the third of the trilogy. And I guess this question is more of a filmmaking how are you approaching the strategy of storytelling and putting together the third in a trilogy, keeping in mind maybe you want it to be more like um, more like a Star Wars and less like a Matrix, you know, where it's like it really holds up. Right. I, I mean, well, I bet you nobody goes, you know, I'm going to make a weak trilogy. Everyone tries to make the strongest trilogy possible, and then it's like how it winds up, you know, being perceived at the end of the day. Uh, this was never conceived as a trilogy, Clerks. Like, it was conceived as, I just want to make Clerks. And then... Well, they died at the end of the original. <laughs> yeah, Dante got killed at the end of the, uh, the, the, end of the original cut. Uh, and then we cut that original ending uh, because, you know, the people that bought the movie, Miramax, they were like, we don't want that depressing ending. This movie's really funny. And then all of a sudden, like, the guy gets killed at the end. Why? Lose that. And I was like, no prob! And cut it <laughs> like that. So... Uh, because of that, we did get to do a Clerks 2, which I love. is one of my favorite films. And then now we get to kind of move forward and tell the story. What I've discovered, you know, because I started writing like the end of 2020, the beginning of 2021. Um, one of the first things is like when I wrote Clerks, I was knee deep in the retail experience on the front lines, you know, at the cash register. So I had tons and tons of material. Um, Clerks 2 doesn't even take place at the convenience store. It burns down. It goes to a fast food joint. And I never worked in fast food. So ultimately, like, Clerks 2 is insanely authentic because it was a mirror to my real life at the time. Clerks 2, to me, is a wonderful movie, but never felt like reality because I didn't live that particular reality. Uh, I love Clerks 2, but it feels more like a movie to me than, than Clerks feels like a documentary because I literally lived that life. Clerks 3, we kind of go back to documentary because in the story of Clerks 3, Dante and Randall, at the end of Clerks 2, they bought the quick stop, so they own it. In the beginning of Clerks 3, Randall has a massive heart attack and almost dies. And then in the hospital, he's just like, you know, I just sat around watching people's movies my whole fucking life. What a waste of a life. I got nothing to show for myself. I own a tiny piece of a convenience store in New Jersey. He's like, I don't have any wife, don't have any kids. I didn't have the family experience like you got and stuff. He's like... What, have I, what do I have to show for my life? He's like, well, no more. I'm turning this shit around. I could die fucking tomorrow. So we get out of this hospital. I'm going to make a movie about my life at the convenience store. And so Dante and Randall essentially make clerks. So in the first clerks, I got to do a lot about like retail hell and what it's like dealing with the customer. In this, we get to kind of go back to that a little bit by virtue of the fact that he's making 
a movie, he's making clerks. So he will be bitching about the customers like the way I used to back in the 90s. The only difference between me and Randall is that, you know, Randall dislikes the customers because he has to deal with them all the time. I, when I used to work there, didn't like customers because I didn't like working, period. But, you know, I've had the, the, enough time to look back and realize if it weren't for those customers, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Those customers were the most important thing that ever happened to me, even the most irritating ones, because all of that wound up as fodder for, for clerks. So this time around, the movie winds up being more autobiographical um, than Clerks 2, uh, kind of more along the lines of the original Clerks, because I, like the main character, I have the heart attack thing to go through. So um, it, it's, it's a fun little meta form, formula for going back into the old movie. Like, we literally get to reshoot scenes from a movie that I made back in, you know, I shot in 1993 with the same actors, like, recreating that show. Like, so you're going to watch people that are forever, you know, 18 to 25 in black and white in one of your favorite films, literally age and become old people in front of your very eyes. By the way, um, that's one, one of the things I'm most excited about, that the original cast is going to come back, not only because I'm a fan of that original cast, but uh, also because uh, we've worked with Marilyn uh, Giolatti, uh, Veronica. Giolatti, well, you know Marilyn as well? We worked with actually not just a day or two, but like multiple weeks um, on a project that um, uh, we we're going to sell to uh, try and sell like a streaming service. Probably have some footage together on it, but uh, yeah. So we're like pretty good friends with uh, uh, with Marilyn. So super psyched that the original cast is coming back. Yeah, she's in it. She's in it uh, as well, man. She gets to come back and play and stuff. And uh, she's got a very, uh, a very uh, her intro scene is very fun. I'll just leave it at that. Nice. Uh, would you say that, because you came up in 1994 at Sundance, would you say the film festivals right now are way too, too gatekeeped or too much of a cool kids club now, 20 years later, that people know of them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, every place is gatekept, for heaven's sakes. Um, that's what the internet was so exciting for me back in the, in the early mid-90s, because it's like, ain't no gatekeeper here. You do what you want. I guess why I dove head deep into podcasting. I'd always thought, like, wouldn't it be great to have your own radio show? Like, you know, and back in the day, you would have to either be hired by a radio station or we had a little local radio station in, in uh, Monmouth County, New Jersey called The Rat. So I was like, oh, my God, maybe one day I could buy The Rat and I'll have my own broadcast antenna. And then I could just, like, spin records and, like, talk if I wanted to. So, and then when podcasting happened, like uh, Scott Mosier was like, have you heard the Ricky Gervais podcast? And I was like, what's a podcast? And he explained it. And I was like, well, that sounds like what we do on the, on the movies, on the DVDs, on the Laserdisc commentaries. We should record one of these podcasts. And so I dove into it because, not because I'm like, we can make money here. In the beginning, there was no way to make money off podcasting. It was the freedom of expression, the ability to jump into a space and fill that space with creativity and nobody saying no. No gatekeeper being like, that's not good enough or something like that. So yes, of course, with film festivals, there has to be somebody picking the films. Otherwise, you know, you've got everybody submits and how do you program that? So it's, you know, the film festivals are kind of defined by their gatekeeping. But um, when we were kids, it was like, make a movie, man, that's punk rock. I'll tell you what punk rock is right now is not making a movie, making a festival like being the person that creates the new film festival. I remember going to South by Southwest in 1997 for Chasing Amy. And I was lucky enough to be a part of this like super panel of all these like indie uh, filmmaking rock stars. So Quentin was on the panel with Robert Rodriguez, with Mike Judge, um, with uh, yeah. me, Steven Soderbergh, for heaven's sake, and George Wang. And Somebody, uh, you know, they're asking us essentially questions like, how do we get to be where you guys are sitting? So somebody asked Quentin about, like, I want to be the next you. And Quentin's like, don't be the next me. He's going, you really want to do something for film? Become a distributor. He's like, become an exhibitor. He's going, we got so many people want to tell the stories. No way to get those stories seen. He's going, that's the next revolution. Is somebody figuring out how to get this stuff out there? Because it can't just be the same six places all the time. That was 1997, man. He was absolutely right. Now we live in a world where it's like those six places aren't the only six places. So much so that I'm like, I think I'm going to take my movie into the NFT world. I think I'm going to take it into crypto. 
So like, it is important, man, to have people that want to make things, but it's even more important to have people showcase those things. So in a world where people are like filmmakers, you know, it happened up at Slamdance many years ago. That's how Slamdance got started. Kids that started Slamdance didn't get into Sundance. They're like, we got finished films, man. Like, fuck it, we'll go up, we'll rent a place, we'll do an adjacent film festival and whatnot. So most punk rock thing you could do right now, kids, if you love film, is not go create a film like everybody else, but if that's your calling, please absolutely do it. You sh everybody should do it at least once in their lifetime and stuff, everybody. But if you really feel like, man, I wanna be in it, I love film so much, we need people who are gonna showcase this stuff. We need new film festivals, we need new distributors. A24, the baby distributor on the block, look how well they've done and stuff over the last few years, but they're a giant now, you know, that make movies that have Adam Sandler in it for heaven's sake. So there's always a need for somebody new to come up and create that thing that's gonna showcase other people's work, which showcases your work at the same time. So yeah, I, I, as much as uh, I, I love supporting the would-be or first-time filmmaker, I, I'm now a champion of like the would-be first-time film festival thrower. You got one of those, man, and you need help getting attention, you reach out to me, man. I'll do a panel for you or whatever. But like more venues to showcase the work is, is better for everybody. Thing, I just want to know how big is the theme of cryptocurrency in Clerks 3? Is that, um, it's obviously a part of it. Is it, is it a big theme? It is. It's, I would call it a subplot. Um, for those who remember the character of Elias, uh, you know, played by Trevor Furman in Clerks 2, um, he was their, uh, he was Randall, their, their co-worker, Randall and Dante's co-worker, but uh, overly Christian. Um, we've added to Elias this time around. He's overly Christian, but he's also overly crypto as well. So he is a, made, a main character throughout our entire story. And he, like right in the first three minutes of the movie, he starts dumping crypto information on us and he is all for it and randall is completely against it uh, altogether so it it runs through the entire like movie right up until the third act as well um and and i was thankful for it i'll be honest with you because the first draft of clerks 3 i did i absolutely loved but it's all predicated on the past by the time you movie with a three on it in it guess what you're going to talk about one and two a little bit and stuff so whereas one was fresh and original and I got to say things nobody had ever said before, by the time you get to three, you're reiterating a lot of the same of thesis, of course, and also you're exploring the characters differently than you did in, in, in Clerks. Like you go deeper into their wants and needs. It's more poignant as the older they get and stuff like that. So um, with that, like, you know, you, it's, you get to do that stuff, but you also kind of get to, you know, I, I didn't have anything new in the screenplay, so to speak. Like, think about it. it they're making a, a film about their lives. That's something that I did a long time ago, too. So indie film's not fresh and brand new. It's been around for a while. So there was nothing in the screenplay that spoke to the present. When I did the second draft, that's when I started bringing in the crypto storyline. And I liked all the stuff I'd had for Elias in the first draft very much but he still felt like one shade lighter than Dante and Randall. They were completely colored in and you get all their motivations and everything's there. And I felt like we had like a little bit more to go with Elias. And then the introduction of blockchain and crypto into my life filled that gap and informed it so nicely. So now when I read Clerks 3, yes, it's very predicated on the past and the boy's long tenure working at Quick Stop. But now there's also this new component, which allowed me to bring in a new character, a character named Blockchain Coltrane, who is part of their, their world as well. And it, it, gave, it put, you know, the finger on the pulse, as opposed to like a movie that's all predicated on that once happened before. It's, there's, it was the freshest, newest thing in the screenplay. And I absolutely loved it. It made it feel current. And, and relevant and stuff like that. So when I wrote the first one, I was behind the cash register. So everything was happening to me, very experiential. I'm in retail and as much as I own a comic book store in New Jersey, but I don't work the register. So I don't have those frontline tales of dealing with Karens and people like that and shit like that. So instead having like this crypto storyline 
felt very fresh and new to me and made me feel like, all right, right on. Like if somebody's coming in for the first time, they're like, all right, this is new. The rest of it is Dante and Randall, Jane, Silent Bob as always, but this aspect of it is new. It really puts it in a place, you know what I'm saying? Like puts it in a moment in time. And one, and one thing you mentioned earlier on is how surprised you were about the, the passion of the cryptocurrency community, you know, bringing you in. Um, one of the things, Aaron and I, that would be fun, if you're willing, we want to pitch you some like good PR type things that would ingratiate you into the crypto community just for fun and see, get your thoughts as a filmmaker. Done and done, boys. You fire away. Yeah, right. These are equally, I think, good ideas, but just as much good marketing things in general. Um, you, if requested, pay your actors in Bitcoin for either Clerks 3, because that's a, that's a big movement we're seeing professional athletes going out and get paid in Bitcoin, even if it's just a portion. Um, that, that would like really ingratiate you, know, you into the Bitcoin community, you know, you know, seeing that you actually believe that Bitcoin has a future. Especially if your actors want to get paid, it, it draw just as much PS, uh, PR as like the NFL does. I would do that in a heartbeat, man. Uh, probably not our two main lead guys, but I bet you the guy who'd be up for it would be the dude who stands next to me, Mr. Jason Muse, and myself at this point. So that's definitely a great idea because it's, it's a great narrative. It's great to do press and be like, well, we got paid in Bitcoin or we got paid in crypto. People be like, what the? So I, great idea. I would convince Marilyn to do it. I don't know if she would normally, but I would convince her. Um, Marilyn's going to be like, uh, you're, you're going to make me a crypto millionaire before you make me a real world millionaire? <laughs> Hey, and uh, we just saw Tesla or Elon Musk put a bunch of his corporate treasury into Bitcoin, other notable public companies. In your next crowdfunding venture, would you ever put a portion of your treasury into Bitcoin before you make the film? Or even some of the profits or revenue? Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, crowd, I've, I've never really done the crowd financing thing, but in terms of revenue, absolutely, I would put into crypto. Once we, once we I buy my first NFT, I'm deep in it. Something tells me I'm going to be hearing from a lot of people, you know, who are just like, hey, man, like you're in the space. Let's play. So I could definitely uh, in a world where you know, I can't say who's making Clerks 3, but we got somebody who's financing and making Clerks 3. If the alt, if the option to get whatever dividends down the road or residuals was offered in crypto in a heartbeat, I would take it. All right, here's my next idea, and it does have more to do with NFTs rather than just Bitcoin. Um, you know, just spitballing. When the movie launches to streaming services, make NFT tickets. It can be part of the same marketplace as what you're doing. And then possible utility, make the NFT uh, tickets. Um, everybody who gets them can prove, verify, attended opening night, and forever prove that within the clerk's community, I guess that's what an NFT would do. That's a genius idea. I love that, man. There's like, there's blockchain proof, code proof that you were there for opening day, so to speak. That's hot. And also, by the way, something you could do with more than just a movie. It feels like you could do live events and do the same thing as well. So everybody that attends the live event, because I do a lot of live shows. So basically what you would do is instead of the ticket for the live show, you would charge, you know, very low for a very specific NFT that locks you into the event as well. Um, ooh, that's good. And just thinking like long term, like for instance, um, today you can go on eBay and find a ticket stub to like Woodstock or Van Halen, and that sells for big money. And there's a community who uh, is going to buy that. And plus, that's like, oh, I was there. And anybody else who has this, I was there. And thinking about this just 20 years down the line, people are going to be able to say with all like concerts and the clerks specifically, oh, I was there on opening night. I was part of this community. And, you know, all of a sudden that connects, say, like 130 people who normally wouldn't be able to talk to each other 20 years from now they have that commonality i love that man I, it, that, like it feels like we'll do it with kilroy before anything else um that which would be and i and i love the idea of like the ticket stub like you know basically you build a gorgeous nft that looks like a ripped ticket stub as well um so i'm, I'm down with that i'm totally i don't know is it do i accept the idea steal the idea borrow the idea what is the term <laughs> Oh, it's yours, baby. Yeah, it's all you. It's all you accept it and you run with it. Um, and then I guess just the final thing, um, part of like NFT functionality, just trying to think of why would somebody want this NFT? Obviously, to be part of the community as a collectible, that's the main reason. But beyond that, some NFTs are like have functionality. 
So this is just one idea that you could do. Empower anybody with a particular NFT that they bought before the uh, movie drop to hold up their phone if they have it that NFT and see something different through their camera phone. Um, everybody who has the NFT will see an alternate picture at some point. Just for a few, just for a scene. In, in the movie itself. In the movie, it could, it could almost be, this is just an example of functionality, but in the movie itself, it's just a way like, oh, I wanna, when I go see this movie, I wanna see the alternate thing, so I'm gonna make sure I have this NFT too. Um, I know in the flick we've got, um, there's a storyline that involves um, something similar, but at, at one point, like uh, Elias holds up an NFT for everybody to see in the store. What you're saying is I could code that. So if you're in the audience, you could capture it. And then all of a sudden, like there's a side thing here. Well, like, so for this technology, it's already available without the blockchain. Obviously, if you wanted, anybody could like hold up their phone and you could program it to see something different. If you make it an NFT, so it's part of this collection, um, then all of a sudden um, it's just, you know, people are going to want this NFT to go with the movie and they're going to see something that's just a little e Easter egg or something. The movie through they would put it through, they're looking through the phone and suddenly they're seeing like a, a, an AR type of altered thing correct correct um not virtual reality but yeah altered virtual reality or real augmented. reality augmented I love augmented, it augmented yeah I'm taking that in because I we do it is like there are two moments in the movie where he shows off um, his NFT and if if I can make that like David was going you could do something where people could capture that or you could buy it in advance so that when it happens they know to capture it and blah blah blah. So that is something, because there is, I, I don't want to say what it is, but there's a thing in the plot that actually people are going to be able to engage with, I think, before the movie even comes out and stuff, which would tie in beautifully with this. Yeah, those are just the ideas I thought of um, the other and, day. So and, feel free and, to use them or not, whatever. And by the way, yeah, if, you, if they're bad, you can tell us that too. These are just <laughs> <laughs> thinking out loud here. Those are fun ideas. Like, I guarantee anyone looking in the comments, you won't find somebody being like, on that like those are all fun <laughs> ideas and worth doing and stuff and not that difficult to pull off and worth hearing now as I'm about to head into before cameras. Like, you know, the worst time to hear this idea would be like after we shot the movie. So like, it's good to talk about it now. Kevin, I have two final questions. I don't know if Aaron has a few, but uh, this first one is, this first one is not crypto. The second one is crypto, super niche and feel free to be as specific or as not specific as you want. Like we said, besides our love for crypto, we are here in the entertainment industry. And we actually have two films, shorts, that are about to take to festivals. Our goal is just for people to see them. One's a super dark comedy. What advice would you give, because you've been to so many of these festivals, on being at a film festival? Um, when I went to my first film festival, I knew absolutely nothing. That was Sundance with Clerks and had to learn like on my feet. In retrospect, like I doubt I would have changed anything about the experience, but I remember like the first time I had an opportunity to do a Q&A after the screening, I felt like, oh, it's too late, it's midnight, nobody's gonna care. And so I passed the mic, I was like, that's okay, we don't need to do it, which is ironic, because all I do is talk in real life now. So going in, um, don't have that moment, like where you're like, well, I, I you know, I, I'm sure everyone wants to go home. They're at a film festival, like they're there to watch films, and more importantly, they watch the films, then afterwards they want to hear from the filmmaker. That's what's different about when they normally go to the movies. Normally they go to the movies, they don't get to hear from the filmmakers or the cast afterwards and stuff. So don't discount your experience to make the experience better for others. That's what I was doing, going like, well, we won't do it because people want to go home and stuff. And that wasn't the case at all. And, you know, I don't regret it, but I've missed out on my first opportunity to do the thing which later on came to define me, like speaking about the experience after the experience is done. So you, you don't know, you get one bite at this apple. For all I knew, I was never going to another film festival and stuff like that. Behave accordingly. And I don't mean like wreck the joint, but I mean like suck the marrow out of the bones. Like this is, you earned this. You did something good enough where people were like, come, we want to showcase you. Revel in that. You know, don't be an ass about it, take advantage of people or something like that, but just like enjoy it, like savor every moment because for all you know, you don't get to do it again and stuff. So first and foremost, I would absolutely say that. Second, you guys have an advantage going into things now because you got an audience with you. Like think about it, like before you go do anything, you drop one of these videos and be like, oh, by the way, 
our day job thing, the other thing we love doing, come check it out. That's something that I didn't have in the beginning. I had to build up and work and, and, and find an audience that would follow me. So right then and there, you guys get to stride into almost every situation now with the confidence of an audience behind you. And as you'll find, and as I'm sure you might already know, but like if people are ardent about you for what you do here at Altcoin, they will be ardent about you for what you do with film as well. A fan is a fan is a fan. So you get to bring those people on the journey with you and think about how you cheer each other on. And I'm sure you got family that cheers you on and friends and stuff. There's no greater feeling than when people have no investment in you other than like, oh, you made a thing and I enjoy it. Cheer you on. It's one thing you get cheered by friends and family and whatnot and never take that for granted. That's an important, powerful thing. But the day that a total stranger is like, I'll follow you. Like what you said spoke to me. So I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt next time. And then the time after that. And you've built an audience. You do that every, every day with your show, for heaven's sakes. You build an ardent audience that's like, I love these guys. I love these guys. And you talk to them about something that is a common frame of reference for you all. It's very communal. But you also then get to like spread your wings like everybody else and be like, I also have interest in this thing. And I would like to take you into that. I take you along on that interest with me. So that is, it's insanely valuable. Having an audience behind you will put, you know, to borrow from Bette Midler, will put winged beneath your wings. Even at times when the box office is not your friend or critics tell you you f***ed up or even the audience at large is like, you made yoga hosers, you idiot. There are those who go with you on every journey who are just like, you know what? It wasn't as good as that, but I'm glad you did it. Now moving forward onto the next one. And that is important for a creative, any creative, not just baby creatives. I'm talking about, I've been doing this nearly 30 years. It's always important to know, to have somebody out there to just remind you, you didn't fail. Failure would have been not making the thing. You, you succeeded. And yes, it didn't connect in the way that perhaps you had thought about or dreamed or you've seen other people's stuff get reacted to, but you have the thing that is most important. You have something that a lot of people don't. You created a thing, it's yours, and it'll never go away. And it may not be like the thing that opened every door for you, but it's definitely you trying a key in a lock. All right, that key wasn't it. I'll try the next key and stuff like that. It's all an important part of the procedure. And sometimes we feel alone as creatives. So it's important to have audience behind you. Right now, you boys have audience behind you before you even go like, by the way, here's what we, uh, what we really want to do is direct. You know what I'm saying? So like, that's, that's powerful. I envy you boys for that, for having that at the beginning. I, I got it. I eventually got it and built to it and stuff. But who knows what I would have felt like, how much steam I would have had in my stride if I knew I was coming in with an audience. Because that makes you powerful to any potential distributor, studio, like, oh, you got you, you already got asses in seats? Like, come on in, we'll do the rest. We'll put together some marketing and stuff, but if you can bring people already, that's a great thing. When I was young in my career, that was a thing that they would always try to beat out of you. Like, you know, I'd always put in jokes referencing the other movies. You know, I tried to connect my films in the View Ask universe. And invariably, you know, from the third movie on, there was always somebody in the, in, on the studio side in the process who was like, why do you have this reference to like clerks in here? What if somebody didn't see clerks? They're not gonna get it and they're gonna feel stupid and drop out of the movie. And I was like, well, maybe that's possible, but I know the other thing is really possible, which is I saw clerks, they make a reference to it in this movie. It makes me like this movie even more because I'm like, oh, shit, that shit tied together. So for years, people were like, don't do that. And they try to beat it out of me. Like so many examples of things that like I took out of a script because people were like, that's too inside baseball. Now we live in a world that's all inside baseball and everybody wants everything interconnected and like that. So nobody knows anything. And if I had an audience going in, like I eventually built one up, I could make my own artistic choices and be like, well, no, I don't agree with you. I don't want to do that. And I'm not talking about being an obstinate, obstinate that's like my way or the highway people filmmaking like everything is a collaborative medium no filmmaker ever does it by themselves even if they're twins and stuff there's a bunch of people that come on board and, and whatnot but ultimately you are responsible for what people are going to see nobody ever going to go up to the script supervisor and be like you know that movie you worked on it 
sucked. Like they're gonna go right to the filmmakers. So the filmmakers carry the cross, good and bad. You know, they get all the praise, but they also get shit upon if everything goes wrong or if the audience perceives that it wasn't as good as it could have been. So it helps to have that those people there already who are like, we believe in you boys, doesn't matter what they said, we believe in you. Or you hear what they said? We've been saying that shit for years. We backed that play, we co-signed. So that's that's the best blessing that you have walking into your careers right now is you've built this audience on this platform. They're gonna follow you for the rest of, of, their, of their lives. As long as you don't betray them, as long as you're authentic with them, as long as you always give them the truth and the passion. People will follow you for passion, man, because not a lot of people can express passion in life. They don't feel comfortable doing so. When they see others doing it, it makes them feel at ease. And that's what creates community. That's what creates a tribe. People are like, oh, you feel the same way about that? Because if I tell my friends over here how I feel about it, they say, look at me like I'm stupid. But I tell you, and you get it, and we understand each other. That's invaluable. And right now, you guys have that in your back pocket. Use that steam everywhere you go. Never be afraid of it. Never be ashamed of it. The audience only wants to help you. Never be, like, like I said in the beginning of my career, I was like, well, I don't want to make people stay later. They probably want to go home. Bull, man. They're there for you. They're there because they appreciate you, and they want to see you do well that audience you bring with you. So don't ever be afraid of them. Don't be afraid to tap them as a resource. They'll be with you forever and you'll reward them by giving them your art, by giving them your point of view, by giving them your perspective like you do here now on this show, which is something about reality. Just think you could take that same thing and take it into the world of fiction narrative and they'll love you even more because you can touch people's heart with a story. They don't even understand like what's going on. We're like, oh my God, that. That took my breath away. What was that about? You know, and you've done your magic and moved the f on. And they love you for that magic, so they'll follow you when you move to the next place. So that's my best piece of advice. You've got the audience with you now. Never disavow them. Always bring them with you. They're part of your journey. You are too, but you're more than that. you got a bunch of cats who are already behind you. I've seen the numbers on your show, man. So you already got people in your corner. Don't be afraid to bring those people with you. They want to go on the journey. Wow. Hell yeah. And Thank you, Kevin. On that journey. Super thoughtful perspective. Thank you, kids. I've been in this, uh, you know, I've been creative for a little bit. So naturally, when we, it's like I said, that thing you can talk about, you know, with other people. Some cats I can't talk to about being creative. The world I can at large, man. Like, because especially like this space, because everyone's, everyone's creative in this space. Even people that are just like, I can't draw, but man, I buy these NFTs and stuff. There's creativity to that as well. Aaron, final question? No, I thought you had one more. Yep, final question. What cryptocurrencies, Kevin, do you hodl? Right now, I've got a tiny percentage of a Bitcoin, for heaven's sakes. And I'll be honest with you, it did not capture my imagination. If that had been my only interactivity with crypto, I think it would be a piece of a Bitcoin that I looked at like anytime somebody who gave it to me, which is Jason Muse, was like, hey man, how much is your Bitcoin up to? I'd be like, oh, uh, this. So it didn't capture my imagination like the artistic angle of it did. That, that pulled me in like whole hog, so much so that I'm like, this is what we're doing for the next month. We're building this crypto studio. Everything put everything, aside. everybody put everything to aside. We need to build this in order to go forward and stuff. So I don't know, like, you know, there was today, between yesterday and today, there were a bunch of people who were like, you can jump in on Dogecoin, man, they're going to pump it up on 420 and stuff. That, that's too smart for me and also too, like, strategic and, and like, I'm, I'm just not in it for that. And I don't begrudge anybody that, if, like, they want to play the finance game, that's great. So I can't see that I'll uh, be like, um, what was the word? Hodling. Hodling. Uh, it's a, it's a a Bitcoin, but yes, yes, just just a tiny bit. But I, I can't say that I'll I will be like uh, the financial uh, wizard. Uh, I don't think it's going to go that way. I think it's always going to be NFTs for me, or uh, you know, to a larger degree. Well, what about your uh, son-in-law? You said he's or future son-in-law. You said he's into crypto. Has he mentioned any specifically that you remember? Uh, yes, right now he's a big ETH fan, and he's got like a bunch of that. He's got a bit a little bit of Bitcoin as well, like me, a percentage of Bitcoin. Um, he was he was the one that I was like, you know, I was trying to uh, seem like I knew more than I did. So I was like, are we doing Dogecoin today? Actually, the first time I said it, I was like, are we doing doggy coin today? He goes, you mean Dogecoin? And I was like, is that how you say it? He goes, yeah. I was like, but it looks phonetically like doggy coin. He's going, no, it's Dogecoin. 
And I was like, are you going to do it? And he's like, no, I don't really, I don't believe in the pump dump. And he went into his philosophy and stuff like that. And I was like, right on. And in one small moment, I could bond with a 26 year old and feel like just a little bit younger than I really am. That's awesome. Links down below to Kevin's NFT drop and where you can find Tim down below in the description. Kevin, thank you for coming on, taking the time and sharing your perspective. Gems, absolutely pleasure to do this, man. Thanks for making the time. I'll come back after we do the auction, let you know how it went and whatnot. Yes. I may be here and be like, kids, don't ever do that again, you know, <laughs> or, or I may be like, kids, this is the place, man. Like, you know, this, one of my favorite things I've been talking about lately is like, the short filmmakers, monetizing a short film. Something you don't really get to do in the real world, but like by making it an NFT, minting it onto an NFT, you can make your budget back. Like that's something that we didn't have the ability to do that back in the day. So it's a fertile playground. I'm glad you kids are playing into it as well. Thanks for welcoming me to it.